Hello Booktube! I have a Friday Mega Stuff video for you here, although once again there's not much in the way of Mega uh, to stuff. What you doing? What was that epic shake? Do you want to see your fans? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Who are they? Huh? Oh. Well, well. One of you asked if that was dried blood on her on her front whiskers. It's not. <laughs> it's dried dog food, but it's not dried blood. Is it, baby? <laughs> the blood runs right off. <laughs> A little chilling to admit. Uh, but no, I, I don't have much in the way of mega stuff uh, to talk about. I did, in terms of a rice cooker update, I have a beautiful little $15 rice cooker, Condi, uh, and I have been experimenting. I've got the rice cooking down down pat, but I've been experimenting on. What are you doing? Oh. I've been experimenting with uh, broccoli, and uh, my first two attempts, the broccoli was as tough as leather when I was done with it, and uh, I realized that that was not from cooking too much; it was from cooking too little. It was from steaming too little. So I'm going to experiment a little more with that, even if it means I I like a, a nice. Uh, pile of broccoli on top of my huge pile of rice. So I, I want to do that. And if it, it looks to me like the, the standard steaming time for a bowl of rice uh, is not sufficient steaming time for a tray of broccoli. And my, my hope was that I could cook them both at the same time and just set it and forget it. Just don't, don't fuss over it at all. But I, it doesn't look like that's possible. So what I think I'm going to try and do today is steam the broccoli separately. Uh, may, maybe the fact that the rice is cooking in the water is, obviously it must be weakening the steam, right? Because so, it's taking a lot of that for itself. Maybe if I just steam the broccoli over water, it will steam a lot faster and a lot more thoroughly. So we will give it a try. I know exactly what I want it to be like. Uh, so I'll just angle towards it. And the nice thing is that the the my mistakes are still edible. <laughs> so, I mean, you could buy a bag of raw broccoli from the grocery store and eat it. So uh, I, my mistakes are still edible. But that is my my uh, Condi update. <laughs> and then there's periodicals. I got a couple of periodicals in the mail. Uh, one of them is the greatest periodical uh, of them all, and that is National Geographic. The headline here is about the vanishing Great Lakes. How the... Look at that! Look at that! The uh, look at how far down those steps have to go to get to the to the Great Lakes. There's a map in here that shows the Great Lakes are disappearing. There's no uh, there's no way around that. <laughs> there's no there's no way. Yeah, you can see the the usual Great National Geographic visuals. Uh, the Great Lakes are are vanishing, and this article is, is all about that. But uh, another article, one that I that is going to <laughs> is going to have a far more immediate uh, uh, resonance with me. There's an article on uh, the snake bite epidemic in Africa, and uh, what is being done about it, and how to help people who are far away from medical help and all that. And of course, that's going to bring back a ton of memories because there was I. There is not a species of snake anywhere in Africa that did not end up biting me at some point or other. I have been through, in not just Africa, but in Africa, I have been through that so many different times. So many, so many different kinds of snakes from the ones that, that won't bite you unless you really surprise them, unless you uh, alarm or startle them, to the ones that uh, will come looking for trouble. They'll, they'll, they want to bite you. They, they either from territoriality or because of the way humans smell as opposed to other animals. I don't have any idea. Some of them uh, don't make any bones about it. So, so that's going to be a, a wincing article to read. But there's also the new Harpers, uh, which, uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff in it, but I immediately turned to the uh, the book section at the back. Uh, there's a short story by Nicole Krauss. Uh, what else? Okay, the new books... The Har Harpers has a regular feature where they, they round up uh, some new books and review them. And this one is done by Andrew Martin. What's he have to say for himself? Uh, he reviews Disipatio by H uh, Disipatio HG, The Vanishing, by Guido Morselli. It has been oddly comforting these past few weeks to read a novel about living in total isolation after an inexplicable catastrophic event causes the entirety of Earth's population, save for one very concerned narrator, to vanish. 
This book is a useful reminder that things can always get worse. Morselli, the author, died by suicide in, 1930, in 1973, shortly after the book was rejected by a publisher, the seventh manuscript of his to meet that fate. As Randall dryly notes in her, inter in her introduction, that is uh, uh, Frederica Randall, the translator, uh, quote, perhaps we shouldn't be surprised that the novel itself begins with a suicide, a suicide deeply desired but finally thwarted. Sadly, Randall, an accomplished political journalist and extraordinarily lucid translator, herself died in May of this year. Okay, all right. But you started off this very paragraph with notions of comfort. So maybe you should have concentrated in this opening paragraph on the abandoned world, rather than shifting immediately to people dying and killing themselves. That's, there's nothing oddly comforting about that. Uh, but what, have we, what else have we got here? So one person finds himself wandering throughout an empty world. We, we, we wait for him to find a companion, to hear a crackling SOS over the radio, or discover a message left behind, anything to set a plot in motion. But instead, he contemplates a travel poster from the Bahamas and thinks the death prize, like collective tourist imagination, makes sense in a country like our own, hugely dedicated to improving the activity of travel. He smashes a shop window to steal some grapefruit and reflects that anarchy has finally prevailed through the abolition of private property, even as, quote, a monarchy has been installed in the most elementary meaning of the term, all power to one man. He starts wearing women's clothing, not, quote, for erotic purposes, he insists, but because, quote, they don't weigh on you this time of year. This doesn't really explain the stockings, garter belts, and gigantic lacy panties, but no justification needed. Yeah, okay. <laughs> the no justification needed is maybe a sop to avoid being mobbed by the blue checkmark Twitter skulls, who might think that you are verging into the territory of being anti-trans or anti-cross-dressing. Uh, but in fact... Although no, ex no justification is needed in real life, plenty of justification is needed in a novel. If the character says he has motivation X for doing something, and motivation X is obviously not the one that applies because it flies in the face of sense, as it seems to do, then, you know, is that ever explored? Or is that just the author being lazy? Dead or not? <laughs> I don't, don't know. Well, let's... What if, what, okay, so Andrew Martin then reviews Proustian Uncertainties by Saul Friedlander, which we just saw the other day. A uh, slim book on uh, the author revisiting Proust. Uh, huh. Whether because Proust was anxious of too much self-revelation or was simply dividing himself judiciously among his creations, as many great novelists do. Really? Many great novelists? Any uh, novelists who history has yet has been rude enough not yet to declare great do any of them divide themselves up among their characters Ooh, i wonder <laughs> uh, he suppressed these characteristics in a figure that uh that m most outwardly resembled him huh okay uh okay so the the review of uh proustian uncertainties tells us what friedlander is interested in looking at in the book but doesn't really tell us uh, about the book, uh, whether or not it's any good to read. And then we have, uh, uh, then the next one is Daniel Evans' book, The Office of Historical Corrections. Uh, in this title, in the title work, it's a collection of short stories and one novella. In the title work, she imagines an underfunded bureau of the federal government called the Institute for Public History, which is dedicated to rectifying incorrect statements about the past wherever in the United States they may be found. <laughs> uh, Okay, uh, let's see here. In the wrong hands, the marshalling of so much sociological material risks didacticism. A morally san salutary but lifeless march to a preordained conclusion. That's well, that's well put. Uh, but Evans is interested in the nuances and contradictions of the characters she depicts. Again, you're telling us what the author is interested in. Uh, she wants to understand the messy, contingent processes through which history is created, and her curiosity and empathy extend throughout the collection to characters buffeted by personal and political crosswinds. Okay. All right. But those things don't negate the first part. You you say, I mean, you start that off with but. But Evans is interested in the nuances and contradictions, but it could still devolve into didacticism. 
if I mean if, if the book whether or not she explores those part those nuances in her characters doesn't mean doesn't stop the book from being didactic from from browbeating you the key I suspect in the book I it's on my docket I'm reading it uh, this week probably this weekend sometime I, the key is whether or not there is what was it again the preordained conclusion. And if the preordained conclusion of the uh, Institute for Public History is that white people always lie about history and black people always tell the truth, well, that is a preordained conclusion. That is didacticism. So, or, or vice versa. So, uh, okay, this Andrew Martin person. Uh, what what is the last book that he does? Privilege and Punishment: How Race and Class Matter in Criminal Court by Matthew Clare. Very, very similar to a book that we got the other day about crime and punishment in America. Uh, Claire's point, simply put, is that the system should take more care to understand defendants' lives and circumstances. A court that was, for instance, able to see why certain defendants might choose a short prison sentence over a prolonged period of probation would be more widely trusted and thus more likely to produce better outcomes. Though the solutions he proposes are a varying plausibility in the, in the, in the near term, Claire has done a significant service simply by reframing the issue. Okay, again, not a word about what the book is like to read. So, uh, Andrew Martin had best not quit his day job, which is... Oh, that's right, he's a writer of literary fiction. He's a Brooklyn writer of literary fiction. Andrew Martin, yes, remember Andrew Martin. Cool for America. Uh... Early work, that Andrew Martin. Uh, stories, uh, after story after story about sexist nihilists smoking on back porches. Uh, Well-written stories. Uh, so is he the end of it? No, no. Then we have uh, uh, David Eulin reviews <laughs> all of the Alfred Hayes that is reprinted by the New York Review of Books. Okay, so that's something that I'm going to read just for you and then not for uh, the subject matter. And then Brian Dillon reviews uh, that book uh, by Marjorie Garber, A Study of Character, uh, which I thought was disappointingly light. So we'll see. I haven't read the review yet. We'll see what that's like. But that those were the uh, the periodicals. Uh, and then we have two pieces of mail. Oh, so we'll see. We'll see what those are. We don't have to. This, this mega stuff video doesn't have to be four hours long. Uh, let's see. Let's see what the first of these is. Oh. <laughs> oh, great. Fantastic. Okay. Uh, this is a series. Uh, once again, the... Uh, <clears throat> I, I simply do not understand why anybody would think it was a good idea to paste a pub sheet into an ARC. Uh, but anyway, this is going to come out next year, I'm sure. Uh, yes? Yeah, February. And this is by Mick Heron, and it's called Slow House. And this is the latest in a series set in this particular police precinct. These are fantastic. Just fantastic novels. Uh, Mick Heron's slightly cracked universe of washed up MI5 spies expands and grows richer in this latest book. A perfect entry point into the smartest, most prescient espionage series being written today. And I agree. Slow Horses, the first book in I believe Slow Horses was the first book in this series, is so good. Yes, Slow Horses is so good. And it goes on from there. They just, they're, you will root for these people, even though they are, by most uh, yardsticks of spy fiction, losers. <laughs> you'll, you'll root for them anyway. Uh, uh, let's see here. Mick Heron is the most award nominated and award winning espionage writer of the last quarter century, and that's not hyperbole. Between Dagger Awards and a myriad of other prestigious trophies, he has enough hardware to create an iron throne of crime fiction awards. <laughs> uh, okay, so what is this book? It's the perfect book to begin this necessary series. The eponymously titled after the series itself, it serves as both an excellent introduction and a thrilling series installment. Truly, you can pick up any book in this series and understand what all the fuss is about. Well, I don't know that that's true, because I started at the beginning, but... I suspect it because my, as you know, if you watch this channel, my antenna are always up when I read subsequent books in series for, among other things, is this a novel? Can this stand on its own? If somebody found this one and didn't know anything about anything else, would they enjoy it? And I always get that impression with these books. So, uh, 
Okay, this isn't going to tell me anything about this novel, but that's all right. It doesn't have to. This is this is a terrific series. Fantastic to know that there's a new one. And also a smart decision on McCarran's part uh, to, to give us a kind of extra standalone novel, a place that is a jumping on point. That's, that's extra smart. Uh, great. I'm enthused for it, but of course it's a 2021 book, so I won't be reading it uh, until the new year. So uh, let's see. Let's see what this next one is. Are they both going to be advanced copies? Or are they both going to be new? Uh, ah, yes. Okay. All right. This is uh, a March release, so this is also something that I won't be reading, but I can tell you about it. Uh, this is by Alec McGillis, and it's called Fulfillment. Winning and losing in one-click America. Fulfillment. All of a sudden, it takes on a whole new meaning, and there's the truck on the road, the Amazon truck on the road with a barcode. Oh, I like that already. Uh, let's see here. Uh, this is a heartbreaking piece on the disparate effects of virtual learning you may have recently... Oh, no. The author wrote a, a heartbreaking piece on the disparate effects of virtual learning that has recently appeared in The New Yorker, which doesn't come here to Hyde Cottage anymore. And it's $10 an issue on the stands, so I'm a little bit behind in my New Yorkers. Uh, and this, is, this, this book is another crucial disparity on the forefront uh, in fulfillment his investigation into the impact of Amazon on America's towns and cities. So this isn't just a book about Amazon. In the same way that the COVID-19 pandemic has shed light on pre-existing inequalities, Amazon's takeover of virtually every industry in the, in the American economy has underscored issues that have been festering for decades. In fulfillment, Amazon serves up a fr as a frame through which McGillis tells the story of increased regional inequality, concentration of wealth, consolidation of business, and most importantly, the Americans who are affected by it all. <laughs> from Seattle to Dayton, from uh, open plan offices teeming with free snacks to the COVID-plagued warehouses and cardboard manufacturing plants, McGillis exposes the true human cost of one-click capitalism. It's extra home. I'm an Amazon Prime member. Uh, uh, the author is a senior reporter for ProPublica and recently the recipient of a George Polk Award. Uh, and he lives in Baltimore. Okay, fantastic. Well, and this is very tempting. They both are actually very tempting, but uh, but they're both 2021 releases. One fiction, one nonfiction. Uh, they'll probably be really good, but I'm not going anywhere near them because <laughs> I'm not do I'm not reading any 2021 books uh, in 2020. So <laughs> so that's it. That was your your mega stuff video. My wrestling with broccoli. My battle with broccoli. Uh, and the mail. So, so maybe we'll have a more antic mega stuff video tomorrow, provided I can uh, escape sneezing. I sneezed uh, 1,013 times yesterday, including a five-hour stretch where it was every seven seconds. So, one, two, three, four, five, for five straight hours. So at first I would I would sneeze and then I would reach forward and hit one letter of the thing I was typing. Then I would sneeze again. I'd reach forward and type and hit another letter of the thing I was typing. Eventually, you start to become an oxy. You start to become very lightheaded and you also start to experience a huge amount of abdomen pain. Uh, and after that, the sneezes start producing a fine spray of blood. You can't do that on the keys of your keyboard. So after a while, I just had to curl up and just shut down completely just so that all I was was sneezing and that lasted th that block lasted for five hours but the constant sneezing lasted for the rest of the day for the whole of the day so I didn't get a whole lot done <laughs> I didn't do a mega stuff video because that's all it would have been about I don't want this one to end up being all about that but uh, we'll see if tomorrow is more merciful lots going on here at Hyde Cottage but uh if if tomorrow is merciful, I, we will have a big, boisterous, mega stuff video, and I will also uh, start whacking away at those 8K Q&A questions, because you people came through. Of course, you did, with great questions. So, uh, one way or another, we'll wrap up this mega stuff for now, uh, but I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.